Each spring, the beauty of the cherry blossoms graces the banks of the tidal basin in our nation's capital, welcoming spring and tourists alike. It's really the start of spring, and I think the crowds are part of the fun because everybody's here for the same reason, just to celebrate the glory of the cherries, cherry trees bursting into bloom, and it's so beautiful. We took nine days to drive across the country in order to make it in time for Cherry Blossom Festival. This is an absolutely exquisite floral display. There's nothing like it. I think it's just everywhere you turn and it's beautiful and it raises everyone's spirits and it's a, a beautiful place to be. This is our second day. <laughs> we came back. Bursting forth in all their glory to hail the advent of spring, Washington's cherry blossoms have the nation's capital framed in a breathtaking bower of beauty. Even the parade of pulchritude from 50 states takes second place to nature's floral display, a vivid panorama to impress everyone. Well, nearly everyone. It's a picture an artist could paint, and usually does. The original plantings were a gift from the Japanese government more than 50 years ago. And as the trees blossom, it's like some fairyland transplanted from the Orient. When the cherry trees bloom in Washington, can the tourists be far behind? These cherry trees represent a very special gift of friendship from the people of Japan to the people of the United States in 1912. For more than 1,000 years, the Japanese have adored the beauty and spirit of the flowering cherry trees. Well, a lot of uh, Japanese uh, people like uh, very much uh, cherry trees, uh, cherry blossom trees, because uh, I think it's because of uh, three bees in the spring. It uh, brings brightness. Whole tree is uh, pink or white, so it brings brightness. and beauty, of course, and brevity. It's short, only one week. And uh, that brevity, for some people, thinks it's a little too short, but that gives sort of idea of decisiveness and uh, short but beautiful, and it goes away. Some people think it reminds them of a samurai spirit as well. These much-adored flowering trees captured the attention of travel writer and photographer Eliza Sidmore. The original idea of bringing cherry trees to the tidal basin started with a number of people, but most notice notably Eliza Sidmore. She was a reporter, she was a member of the National Geographic Society, she traveled around the world, and her brother was a member of the diplomatic corps stationed in Japan. She got to see the trees in bloom in Japan, and when she saw them, she thought, hmm, these could be wonderful for that new area on the reclaimed land around the tidal basin. In the early years, Washington looked very different than it does today. They, there were huge areas of swamp and marsh, and in the 19th century, there was a plan to reclaim a lot of that and make add land, actually. The area where the Washington Monument is, for example, uh, was half marsh and not, uh, not able to be built on, where the Lincoln Memorial is, uh, the Jefferson Memorial. So they reclaimed the land. The Macmillan Commission was uh, convened and created a plan that actually led to the development of the mall and led to the creation of the Tidal Basin and what we now know as Haynes Point, the East and West Potomac Parks. But it was very open and, and fairly barren. There were roads put through, simple roads. Um, that area was called the Speedway. It was an area where carriages could race along at the at great speed of, you know, something like under 20 miles per hour, probably more like 15 or 12. Isn't that fun? But Eliza Sidmore had a greater vision for the newly reclaimed land. And she has the idea that those flowering Japanese cherry trees that she'd seen would be perfect here especially because flowering Japanese cherry trees, uh, the art of hanami, of viewing flowers. She's familiar with this, having been in Japan, and she knows that traditionally 
views of cherry trees are considered best when they can be reflected in water. And so here you have this land along the river and the tidal basin has been built, a perfect place for flowering cherry trees. So as early as 1885, she starts going to the commissioner of the, of the parks and suggesting, why don't we plant this type of tree? Ms. Sidmore has been working on this for 20 years, but no one listened to her. In fact, during that time, Eliza approached every superintendent of the Office of Public Buildings and Grounds, encouraging them to plant these Japanese cherry trees along the Potomac waterfront. My favorite story having to do with that is that um, she went to yet another superintendent of public grounds and she said, talked about how wonderful these trees were and how beautiful they would look. And he said, well, that's all very well, but these trees are going to have cherries on them and small boys are going to climb the trees and then I'm going to have to have men and policemen to keep the boys out of the trees and it's just not worth it. And she said, no, no, no. These aren't those kinds of trees. You know, they just have little pips that grow up and birds eat them, there won't be any problem. His response was, well, what good is that kind of tree? And dismissed her. Eliza Sidmore also sent a note outlining her idea to First Lady Helen Heron Taft. Assisting Eliza in her efforts was plant explorer and U.S. Department of Agriculture official, Dr. David Fairchild, who had also traveled to Japan. His wife, Marion Bell, was the daughter of famed inventor Alexander Graham Bell. David and Marion Bell Fairchild had an estate in what's now Chevy Chase called In the Woods, and they planted more than 25 varieties of cherry trees there to see if they grow in the area. And they had what's called a field of cherries, where they just had many of them planted to see which ones would flourish and which ones wouldn't. They, um, and they, they were hugely successful. People would come and have um, tea under the trees when they were blooming. David Fairchild wrote a letter to Spencer Cosby, who was the superintendent of public grounds at the time, and suggesting that the trees be planted. And this letter was forwarded to Helen Taft. The First Lady loves the idea and supports it, and now it has the support of the White House. So it, very quickly, it actually happens. It may actually be, from further reading, that Helen Taft may have already been, even been thinking herself about it. Japanese cherry tree. She had been to Japan on several occasions and was already enamored with these trees. At the time, the idea was to purchase trees that were already growing in the United States. So they, we know that the trees were already here and they were being grown by growers, certainly in Pennsylvania and New York State, possibly elsewhere. Um, but it was her influence and enthusiasm and support for the project that really got it off the ground. Joining the effort was Dr. Jokichi Takamine, a renowned Japanese chemist. Dr. Takamine, who was residing in New York, came down at the moment that they were making decisions, and all this was happening at the same time. So I think it was miraculous that all this sort of happened at the same time. He said, then we, Japan, should donate cherry blossom trees. Japanese diplomats advised Japanese government that Japanese government should do that. And in then Tokyo Metropolitan Office, Mayo Ozaki said it should be given by Tokyo. And Tokyo has given uh, 2,000 trees. I think uh, those people like uh, Dr. Takamine or uh, Mayo Ozaki were committed to Japan-US relations. Uh, they were so grateful to U.S. mediating between Russia and Japan uh, after the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. And so it was a, a, a truly a gesture of friendship that was um, important both for the giver and the receiver and something we can celebrate today for the same reason. When the trees arrived in 1910, there was much excitement, Americans were thrilled to receive them, but they were shocked at how big they were. The Japanese decided to send older trees thinking that they would bloom quicker and that they would create more of a display sooner. They were huge and being older, they also were infested with bugs and funguses and things like root gall worm. And the Department of Agriculture inspectors made a thorough search and determined that the whole uh, shipment needed to be burned, actually. 
And this decision was taken all the way up to President Taft. You can imagine, I mean, here's this fabulous gift from, meant in the best of intentions, and it literally up in flames. One of my favorite stories is that after the trees were burned, someone had to go tell Mayor Yukio Ozaki. And so a young American diplomat was sent to tell the mayor of Tokyo what had happened to the trees. And you can imagine, he walks in and his you know, knees are quaking, dear Mr. Mayor, for, you know, this horrible event has happened and we've had to burn the trees. And the story goes that Mayor Yukio Ozaki said, hmm, it seems to me that your first president in Washington had a problem with cherry trees and he overcame it. I think we can too. And sure enough, two years later, the Japanese sent 3,000 trees, more than 3,000 trees actually, to be planted in Washington. And these trees were pristine. On March 27, 1912, First Lady Helen Taft and Viscountess Chinda, wife of the Japanese ambassador, planted two Yoshino cherry trees on the northern bank of the Tidal Basin. It was a very small ceremony. In fact, it wasn't really a ceremony. It was just First Lady Helen Taft, the wife of the um, ambassador from Japan. The ambassador was present, and also Spencer Cosby and Eliza Sidmore. Today, there is a bronze plaque near the trees commemorating the occasion. Over the next several years, work continued on planting Yoshino cherry trees around the tidal basin. The remaining Yoshino and other varieties were planted in East Potomac Park, about 100 of the original Yoshino trees survive today. It wasn't long after the trees matured that tourists, photographers, and artists alike were drawn to the pink hues and delicate puffs of the blossoming cherry trees along the tidal basin. You've got these beautiful trees. Well, inherently that utterly changes the nature and the perception of this area. And the cherry trees, of course, in the spring when they're in full blossom, only increase that perception. I mean, all cultures enjoy the spring and celebrate the emergence of new life and the blooming of flowers. These headlines from the early 1930s show that some things never change and are as common today as they were back then, like traffic. Shortly after the trees started blooming and uh, when it became clear that there was something going on around the tidal basin, all sorts of things started to happen and they, there was a beach there. They had um, swan boats, they had uh, power boats. So they had canoes. But there was one activity about to take place at the Tidal Basin that was not so popular. In 1938, under President Franklin D. Roosevelt, workmen began to clear ground for the construction of the Jefferson Memorial, a move that would prove controversial because it required the removal of several of the now cherished cherry trees. They chose a spot on the Tidal Basin that had been a beach, and it was surrounded as everything around the Tidal Basin was with lots of uh, cherry blossom trees. So when it became time to clear the area to build the memorial, um, local social matrons um, became incensed. Some of them chained themselves to the trees. The issue was resolved with the promise that more trees would be planted along the south side of the Tidal Basin. And I believe that they actually had to remove the trees and under the cover of darkness because people were still so upset. Today, the Jefferson Memorial stands as a focal point of the Tidal Basin, particularly during blossom time. For centuries, people throughout Japan have been celebrating the flowering cherry trees through music, poetry, parades, and festivals otherwise known as Sukura Matsuri. It's in a lot of towns that they have uh, uh, festivals regarding uh, cherry blossom season. It's uh, <clears throat> end of March to uh, beginning of May, and uh, that coincides with the uh, new start of uh, academic year in Japan, uh, beginning of April. 
So a lot of us in Japan has the memory of uh, starting school under the cherry blossoms. And also a lot of people uh, go to picnic uh, under cherry blossoms and uh, enjoy that too. It didn't take long for Washingtonians to celebrate this special gift of friendship and the sheer beauty of the blossoms. The first celebration of the trees uh, blooming was in 1927 and it was local groups who organized themselves. It was not an official thing. Local people banded together and created an afternoon with a pageant. There were children performing. They reenacted the planting of the trees in 1912. So this would have been 15 years later. Uh, First Lady Helen Taft was present and it was, a, uh, by all accounts, a very memorable and lovely occasion. Uh, there were some other festival and similar pageant, well not pageants, but observances, shall we say, that took different shapes and forms over the next 20 years. By the late 30s, it was very much part of the social fabric of the city, really. So there was some kind of, not official necessarily, but, but regular, let's say regular observance. Um, it right up through to the beginning of World War II. Well, during World War II, the festival was put on hold. They said it was just that the city, the city had swollen to such incredible proportions, so many people coming in and swelling our military numbers. Um, at the time, it was considered even an act of patriotism just to open your home and rent a room to someone because there just wasn't enough space for all the people that moved into the city. It was just a crowd issue. Although there was an act of vandalism, someone did cut down a couple trees. The newspapers very actively condemned this act. Um, so that was the only act of vandalism. Though, during this time, they did start referring to the trees as the oriental flowering cherry trees, rather than the Japanese flowering cherry trees. After the war, they that changed back again. And then immediately after the war, they picked up, and by 1948, there was a festival that began to look like what we have today. When the National Cherry Blossom Festival rise, it signals spring across the country. The festival welcomes over one million people to the Tidal Basin and throughout the city celebrating this special gift as well as exploring the city and all the wonderful activities that the festival has to offer. The cherry blossom trees. One particular activity associated with the festival is the traditional lighting of a very special lantern given to the United States from Japan to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the first treaty of peace, amity, and commerce. The Japanese lantern arrived in Washington in 1954, and it was the 100th anniversary of the treaty that was signed between the United States and Admiral Perry. In formal ceremonies near the two original cherry trees, Ambassador Iguchi unveils a three-century-old stone temple lantern, a gift from the governor of Tokyo to symbolize Japanese-American friendship. Tatsuko Iguchi, daughter of the ambassador, lights the ancient lantern to open the Cherry Blossom Festival with a beacon of hope for peace among nations. The festival today is a multi-week event. That program has grown because the city becomes in concert. All the, the different organizations and key cultural institutions come aboard and present the best that Washington has to offer. There are over 150 performances throughout the, the festival. We partner with over 40 organizations that produce amazing events, art exhibits, uh, dance. The Blossom Kite Festival is another favorite that is, you know, kept for every kite lover to come down and spend the day at the, the grounds of the Washington Monument to, to, to celebrate the festival as well as to fly their kites. We're lucky to have indoor and outdoor events for this wonderful spring um, event. Some of the other key events include a fireworks display. And festival at the Southwest Waterfront. 
The National Cherry Blossom Festival Parade is one of the longest traditions of the festival. The parade has been in existence since the 1940s and it's still today one of the favorites of all of the events. It's interesting to see that some of the first parades, the pictures that we have of some of the first parades, are taken at night. And they started, I think, about 9 o'clock and went down K Street. And there were, you know, the floats were from local restaurants and that sort of thing. Some, some of the states would have a float. Later it moved into a daylight time, and uh, for many years now it's been in the morning. It is uh, beloved by many people. Marches down Constitution Avenue, over 120,000 people attend each year. Many people participate, and this, this is something that, that youth groups, bands look forward to each year. Kids year-round from all over the country, high school bands from all over the country, do fundraisers just so they can participate in this, this nationally known event. Following the parade, partnering with the Japan America Society, uh, they produce the world's largest Japanese street festival. So you can, if you are very interested or curious about the Japanese culture, come on down to Pennsylvania Avenue and get a taste of Japan. They show Japanese uh, exhibitions, uh, the dances, and uh, also uh, sell many Japanese food and goods as well. Taking part in the Japanese Street Festival, as well as the National Cherry Blossom Festival Parade, is the U.S. Cherry Blossom Queen. The first Cherry Blossom Queens were crowned in the mid-1930s. But in 1948, the Cherry Blossom Princess Educational and Cultural Exchange Program was started by the National Conference of State Societies. Each year, a princess is selected from each state and federal territory with a queen chosen to reign over the festival. How is the Cherry Blossom Queen chosen? By a wheel of fortune. About 1948, they started using a big wheel of fortune that spun, and wherever the needle ended up was where Queen uh, was crowned. So um, some years, it, it, well, it's always a random thing. And one year, I think in the early 60s, the wheel spun and it stopped on a particular state and that girl thought she was going to be the queen. And then nobody's touching it, the thing moves and it goes to another state. And so that girl thought she was the queen and I'm sure it must have been awkward and awful for everyone involved but they, that year they had two queens. <laughs> the Cherry Blossom Queen gets to wear a wonderful crown that was given to the festival in 1957 by Mickey Moto, the famous pearl company. And they created a crown that is so heavy with gold and pearls that the queen can only wear it for a few minutes. They take a few photos and then whisk it off and you know lock it away again until the following year. After the festival she here, she goes over to Japan and is greeted by the Japanese Cherry Blossom Association. She makes official visits to various festivals uh, where the trees are blooming. Um, she also represents um, the, the international feeling of friendship that the festival signifies. Well, Japan is the heart of the National Cherry Blossom Festival and the one key thing that we continue to do is celebrate and honor the gift of trees. The festival year-round puts together tree planting programs to honor that and continue the gift and to continue that circle of giving by planting trees as well. It's important for us to continue to educate, especially the youth, about the festival, about the history, about why the trees are so important in the community, and with an environmental message, why the trees are important, and how to really care for the trees. The National Park Service Cherry Tree Maintenance Crew comprised of certified arborists, is charged with caring for the Japanese cherry trees throughout the year. The primary maintenance, and, and realize that our tree crew is just absolutely excellent and have done an amazing job of maintaining the trees. So pruning and watering is almost the only care that they give them. And yet, through that alone, they manage to maintain these trees in an incredibly harsh environment. 
Visitors can also play an important role in maintaining the beauty and health of the trees as well. The most important thing we need to convey to the public is to help us protect the trees. The number one uh, thing that damages these trees is the public. It's us walking here on the roots, compacting the soil, picking blossoms, and climbing on the trees. You would never expect that to hurt it, but this festival brings over a million people every year, and that's on top of the tens of millions we get through the rest of the year. All those little footsteps compact the soil like concrete and suffocate the trees. And then picking one little blossom, you think it regrows, but it doesn't. Um, that's gone forever. Maybe it'll bud somewhere else. But again, one little blossom magnified by millions of people, it has a devastating effect. We have a mascot, Paddles the Beaver, who gets out the message, um, please don't pick the blossoms. So we would very much like people to not climb the trees, not pick the blossoms. Of course, walking around the trees, there's very little you can do about that. Um, but try to stay on the paths when, it, when it's convenient. People often ask, how can we identify the different varieties? And the simple answer is, you probably can't. Now, which ones can you identify? When you go around the tidal basin, they're pretty much all Yoshino. So you see a, a white blossom, five petals, and you guess Yoshino, you got about a 95% chance of being right. There's a few Akabonos, which is just a, a sub-variety of Yoshino anyway. They tend to be a little bit more pink, and the pink lasts a little later. Um, the Okami, there's only one of those, that comes in a very, almost a lavender, a, a very bluish pink, very pretty, but there's only one of those. It's fairly hidden. You'll have to pick up one of our trail guides to find it. Today, more than one million people visit Washington, D.C. each spring to experience the cherry blossoms for themselves and to enjoy the National Cherry Blossom Festival. What started as a simple idea by a small but passionate group of people has grown into an international event celebrating both beauty and a lasting friendship between two countries. I think it's a really uh, very nice uh, symbol of friendship as well as a symbol of Washington now. It's just amazing to really think about how this first gift of trees has become the nation's greatest springtime celebration. When I walk around the tidal basin, you're reminded that life is fleeting, that the cherry blossoms won't be around forever, so you should really appreciate what it is that you have at the time that you have it. As ambassador, I am so gratified to those people, there are other people as well, but uh, those people who have really started this. And uh, I really feel that uh, they have done a great job. We just really love the energy here. So you walk around, you see families, you see pets, you see people of all ages from all different countries speaking different languages. And they're all out here just enjoying the great weather and the beautiful sights of the cherry blossoms. And it's just fun. I think it helps you appreciate how much thought people have put into to growing the trees and keeping this tradition alive. So um, that it's, it's great about nature because you start with one, but then it carries on for years and years and years and more you know, generations afterwards. So um, it reminds you to take good care of the earth as well. It's very extraordinary to me how they touch people, how their beauty affects people of all ages and all walks of life and they don't discriminate in any way and it's almost as if they open their arms and say here we are be joyful and live your life and that's I love that about them. Mm -hmm.